I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today and welcome you to, to our uh, webinar for the NIGMS IMSD GRISE training grants um, T32 programs that are associated with the new uh, NOFOS PAR 24031 and 032. Um, so today what we want to do is, is go over um, some changes to the program, some of the new updates, uh, just so that everyone um, that may have submitted before is aware, or those that may be submitting for the first time are kind of aware of the program. Um, so my name is Jeremy McIntyre. I'm a program officer with both IMSD and GRISE. Um, we'll be joined today by um, Sadella Blatch and Joyce Stam. Um, as well as our grants management uh, folks, Justin Rosenwig and um, review Sonia Ortiz Miranda. So next slide, please. Uh, so everyone is aware that's in the audience, this webinar, uh, all the videos and uh, slides, uh, we are recording live. Um, this will be available on the NIGMS website along with the slides um, so that you can go back and review this information. Uh, also throughout the presentation, we invite you to use the question and answer box um, to post any questions that you might have. Um, program officers or anyone that's not speaking at the moment will be able to answer those questions. Um, so please use those instead of the, the chat function. Um, and then at the end, if we get through this all of this in time, we will open up for a Q&A as well. Um, although we welcome questions directly to us at the end by email if needed. Next slide, please. So just a quick disclaimer um, that you know the webinar, all the slides are for informational purposes. This is going to be a big overview um, and it's not comprehensive of all uh, changes required components um, in the NOFO. So we encourage you to read both the NOFO carefully as well as the SF424 guide. Uh, next slide, please. And throughout this, so we're going to go over um, today an introduction to the programs, key changes that uh, applicants should be aware of um, to the current NOFOs, key program considerations uh, about the IMSD GRISE, highlights for this application, a budget overview, and a peer review overview. Next question, uh, slide, please. So, program objectives what is the goal of the IMSD and GRISE programs? So our program goals um, are to strengthen the research training environments and promote broader participation in the biomedical research workforce by expanding the pool of well-trained scientists earning a PhD, for example, encouraging inclusion of individuals from underrepresented groups. Um, we encourage you to see the notice of NIH's interest in diversity for um, representatives of individuals from these different groups um, and recognize that uh, individuals from underrepresented groups may in fact be different depending on, on institutions as well. Next slide, please. So the major themes for the NIH, NIGMH, GMS predoctoral T32 training programs that should be encompassed in the um, training programs, the submissions, really are, are to have um, sort of multiple goals or themes throughout them. So the first being training objectives. Um, IMSD and GRISE programs should have specific, obtainable and measurable uh, objectives associated with them, be that um, program participants, career goals, outcomes, um, those sort of avenues of the training programs that would be quantifiable. So time to degree, uh, percent completing degrees um, should be part of the training objectives. The T32 should include trainee skills development, uh, so they should incorporate and propose the use of evidence-informed approaches to provide technical, operational, and professional skills to the trainees that will be supported by these grants. We look for the training programs to have throughout them rigor and transparency um, training, as well as training in the responsible and safe conduct of research within the lab environment um, and throughout that training experience. And so in this context, we mean the actual physical safety uh, within the lab. So how to be responsible within the lab, how to be safe conducting research that should be part of the component. And the second theme of this that goes along with this is a commitment to inclusive, safe, supportive, and accessible research training environments. Uh, and for this, uh, this theme really is to promote the development of trainees from all backgrounds 
and by safe here, we're in, you know, um, inclusive, safe sort of um, environments such that they are free from harassment, um, abuse, those sort of uh, um, environments. So we would like them to be safe for them to be able to conduct research emotionally um, as they go through their training. Next slide, please. Um, so the other themes that are involved with the NIGMS training programs, one would be a component of mentoring and training, mentor training and oversight of the trainee mentor matches. Um, so programs should discuss how mentors are trained, how they obtain training, what sort of programs that are going through, um, and then oversight from the training PIs uh, to those trainee mentor matches. Uh, conflict resolution, selection of trainee mentor matches should be part of the themes of the T32. The T32 should also have a component for career preparedness. Um, so what programs, what will the T32 provide um, to enhance or provide knowledge of and skills to transition into a wide range of careers in the biomedical research uh, workforce? And so these can encompass more than just the academic traditional career path, um, but we look forward to see how outcomes or programs should, how outcomes from um, students that have graduated in, uh, impact what career preparedness the program will offer. Um, there should be a strong organizational support for the research training. Um, and then a component of the T32 should involve evaluation of the program. So how the eva program will collect um, and disseminate data on its successes and failures um, for the educational aims that are part of the T32, how we'll make those career outcomes uh, publicly available, um, and to really assess what works or what doesn't work within the T32 to improve training uh, for the next cohorts of students. Next slide, please. So I want to give some eligibility overview uh, for the IMSD and GRISE programs. And so these are broken up based on um, the average RPG funding, um, NIH funding per year over the past uh, three fiscal years. So research intensive uh, institutions or organizations average greater than seven and a half million dollars in research project grant funding from the NIH uh, over those past three fiscal years. Um, research active institutions participate in the GRISE program and they average less than 7.5 million um, NIH RPG, fund, RPG funding um, over the past three fiscal years. So this is the main difference between the two programs, which organizations um, apply for which. Uh, similarities between these, uh, the principal investigators for both uh, GRISE IMSDs uh, must have a full-time appointment at the institution that you're applying from and that we do encourage for both programs, um, multiple PI applications, um, but where at least one individual, one PI is an established biomedical investigator. The trainees for both programs um, under these are you know, similar PhD students. Um, it is the applicant organization that really will select and establish the qualifications for, the tra for your trainees um, in the program, consistent with applicable uh, local laws. Trainees do need to be US citizens or permanent resident um, or non-citizen non nationals. Um, and they should be pursuing research training full-time. So these are full-time PhD students that are going to be supported by either the IMSD or GRISE program. Next slide, please. Some key dates coming up for um, for these programs. Both IMSD and GRISE will have an application due date of January 29th. Um, the first one being 2024. You can see January 29th will be the debt for 24th, 25th, and 26th. Applications will be reviewed in July. Uh, the advisory council meeting for these applications will be in October. 
And for your planning purposes, you can see that uh, IMSD programs, we plan to start the budget date in February of that following year, and GRISE would be May. Um, so if you apply for 2024, the earliest start date would be February uh, 2025 or May 2025 for the IMSD and GRISE program. Next slide, please. So now what we want to do is, is to start updating you on some of the key changes to the current NOFOs that are going to be really where the differences are um, from the previous NOFO that you may or may not have uh, submitted to. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so a summary slide, uh, just so you can go back through and see these. Um, there is an update to the types of applications uh, that's allowed. So we'll discuss this briefly next. There are changes to the required other attachments, um, changes to the appendices, we have change, made changes to the required letters of support. Um, so a singles letter, this will be discussed later. And then uh, there is changes in the budget section, what can be um, amounts that can be uh, requested in the budget. Next slide, please. So the first sort of big change um, is that the difference between new and renewal applications and where we're allowing um, renewal applications to come in. So an application will only be considered a renewal if the organization has a funded grant through the following NIGMS notices uh, listed here on this slide. So if it was IMSD, um, the two NOFOs here, if the um, application was awarded through one of these, you can come in as a renewal. For GRISE, it would be through PAR 19.102 or 21.026. Everything else will be a new application. So just note that you know ineligible renewal applications will not be re reviewed um, and that there are some different requirements for new and renewal applications. And we'll talk about that in a second here. Next slide, please. Resubmissions are only allowed uh, for renewal applications. And so if you are a renewal because your grant was funded through one of the previous NOFOs, you are able to submit a resubmission if the A0 of that renewal is not funded. So you can come back in as the resubmission as an A1. If you are a new application to um, this NOFO and it would not be funded, your next submission would only come back in as a new application. So new applicants that are not funded are not allowed to submit a resubmission. Um, so in this uh, change, we are encouraging that the new, the reapplication is a, it's a new application um, utilizing constructive feedback from the previous review, but you will not have an introduction as typical for a, a resubmission because this is a new one. So um, just to highlight again, ineligible resubmissions will not be reviewed. Next slide, please. Um, so sort of a handy uh, table that we've developed, hopefully um, to sort of streamline as you're deciding what components may be included and what type of application um, you can refer to here. So, you know, the response to prior review um, is only for a resubmission of a renewal that had submitted to these previous NOFOs. So you can include an introduction, mentions of, of scores or um, how well the grant was scored only under this as a resubmission. Progress reports um, should only be included in a renewal um, or the resubmission of a renewal um, and not again in the new in table seven, um, is only for the renewal application or resubmission of a renewal, would not be included in a new application. Next slide, please. So we've made a change as well into the other attachments section uh, for the both NOFOs that they are now being reduced so that there are only two required other attachments. Um, for the new NOFO submissions. So the first other attachment is the baseline data of the trainee pool. Again, there's details in the NOFO for what this data involves, 
Um, it's very easy. We request that you actually name this other attachment baseline data of the tr on the trainee pool. The other required other attachment is the recruitment plan to enhance diversity. Um, again, name that document the same, this sort of recruitment plan to enhance diversity. Those two other attachments are um, required for a complete application. There are two other attachments that are now optional. This would be an advisory committee for your, um, app, uh, for your T32 uh, program. For this, the NOFA will mention that you should not name um, individuals to this advisory committee unless they're already part of a standing advisory committee that you have. Um, but if it's a new application and you're proposing to have one, um, you should detail what your plans would be for an advisory committee without selecting individuals to serve on it until after an award would potentially be made. And then you may also include a other attachment on training activities to detail other activities are involved with the training grant. Anything additional uh, other, you know, in this section um, could lead to the application being withdrawn without review. Next slide, please. There is also um, the appendices. So if you've applied to the previous NOFOs, in this NOFO, their specific requirements for the appendices have been eliminated. Um, so there are some appendices still allowed by the SF424, um, but any of the NOFO specific ones are removed. And we encourage applicants to incorporate this information um, previously that was permitted in like the other attachments and, and appendices to be actually part of the training program. So for example, this would include your retention plans, data, um, trainee data collection and storage plans, conflict resolution protocols. All of these should be now part of that main training program and not included as an appendice. Next slide, please. Okay, so that ends my part of the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Sadella. Thanks, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. My name is Sadella Blatch. I'm one of the GRISE program officers along with Jeremy. And I'm going to just highlight some of the program considerations for both programs. Next slide, please. So first, um, as Jeremy um, started to mention earlier, the goal of both GRISE and IMSD includes promoting broader participation in the biomedical research workforce. So for these funding opportunities, uh, we encourage organizations to recruit prospective trainees for these grants from groups that are underrepresented on the national basis. And the link when you um, are able to access the slides, which we will, which will be are on our websites already, um, that link there takes you to NIH's uh, notice of interest on diversity that Jeremy mentioned earlier. Um, also, though, we recognize that underrepresentation can vary from setting to setting or across different institutions or regions. So organizations, applicants should also design recruitment strategies to promote participation based on local context as well as those national needs. Uh, so we encourage all applicants to consult with their general counsel to be sure that all applicable laws and regulations are being followed. Uh, that is not something that we at NIH can do for you. You have to confer with the legalities for your, uh, your region, your institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing to think about is the breadth of research training disciplines that are involved in your GRISE or IMSD program. So we expect programs to provide research training to students that are in the entire breadth of biomedical PhD granting disciplines at the applicant organization. So we recognize some institutions will have more than one such biomedical research PhD programs or departments, and some institutions may only have one. But the thing to keep in mind here is that we expect these for GRISE and IMSD to span all of these relevant disciplines. We are not encouraging an application where the institution only involves a subset of the programs that offer 
biomedical relevant PhD degrees. We expect this to include um, all of that across the institution. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over a few more uh, general program uh, considerations. And as Jeremy mentioned initially, we're not able to go through the entire NOFOs in this webinar. So for now, I'm just gonna cover some more of these highlights, but of course you're gonna read the full funding opportunity um, to get all of the information you need. So the first one is that we expect these programs to be tailored to the organizational context. And we expect that you will use data to identify specific needs that your trainees have and combine this with the organizational strengths and infrastructure and programming that you have so that your program is tailored to your trainees, your organization, your institution. This also includes that the program is well integrated into one or more, as mentioned, departments and has an, a strong organizational impact. This means that we expect that your training program impacts not only the trainees that are enrolled or appointed in the program, but the organization in a, in a larger sense, other trainees, other policies, procedures, culture, et cetera. Your GRISE and your IMSD program should also be more than only financial aid. We know as, as Justin will discuss, there is a financial component to support the students on NRSA awards such as these, but this is not a scholarship program. This program should be designed to provide rigorous, well-designed mentored research experiences, as well as be designed around a cohort of trainees. And we'll talk about a little bit more about what, uh, what we mean by having a cohort structure. Um, but the goal here again is to also promote trainee skill development. This you will do with evidence informed, creative and transformational approaches to graduate training and promoting broader participation. So you can see bolded here is evidence informed. We also expect that programs have demonstrate effective oversight over trainee development and promote retention. These are key outcomes for these programs that your, your training program needs to be monitoring. And part of that can involve your program evaluation. And one thing that is uh, more elaborated on in these NOFOs is the importance of getting feedback from trainees and evaluating the climate that the trainees are experiencing. And we expect that programs will get this program evaluation and feedback information and incorporate it into program design to improve current and future or renewal programs. Next slide, please. So for trainee support, as I mentioned, GRIs and IMSD should have a cohort basis. Typically, trainees on these programs are supported for two or three years during their PhD. And we encourage you to cluster this support towards the earlier years of the PhD. So within this cohort structure, typically your program will have trainees appointed at similar stages of their PhD for a similar duration and undergo comparable training experiences. So this could be, for instance, your program may appoint trainees in the first or the second year of the PhD and may have them appointed for the first two years of the PhD or years two through four of the PhD, et cetera. You should plan to appoint a new cohort every year of the five years of the program. Now we realize that you might be saying, well, I don't know if my program would get renewed. So if I appoint a cohort in year five or year four, I don't know that I'm gonna have NIGMS funding to continue to support them after the end of the five years. We hope that you would seek a renewal and have plans to support the trainees if you do have a lapse in funding, but do plan in your application to appoint a new cohort every year of the five years. And if you have any expected or potential deviations in your cohort structure, please explain this in the application. 
For example, some programs may provide two or three years of support under certain circumstances, which need to be explained in the application. Next slide, please. So uh, next, I'm going to pass the things over to Joyce to go over highlights of application components. Hi, my name is Joyce Stam, and I'm a program officer for the um, IMSD program together with Jeremy McIntyre. So today I'm just going to give you some highlights of the different components of the application. Um, it's really important to remember that I'm not going to talk about all the application components. Um, and so you should refer to the NOFO to make sure that you have all the components that you need. Um, next slide, please. Um, so it is important to understand the hierarchy of um, the different instruction guides that you have. Um, so uh, in combination with the NOFO, you should also look at the SF424 application guide um, for Form H for institutional training, um, where instructions for SF424 and the NOFO um, contradict each other, you should follow the instructions in the NOFO. Um, there might be notices that would be posted on the NOFO. If those notices exist, those notices supersede what is written in the NOFO and the SF424. So please check um, all these um, different documents for the required items uh, for your application. Next slide, please. Um, so again, here is uh, some. Here are some of the application components and the page limits for them. I'm not going to read the slide to you. Uh, many of my slides are simply for your reference because you can download um, the whole slide set um, after this presentation. Importantly, please stick to the page limits. Um, otherwise, your applications may be withdrawn without review. Next slide, please. So um, one of the components of the application is this R&R other project information form. Um, and I just want to highlight uh, the last item with the arrow that is uh, other attachments. As Jeremy mentioned earlier, there are only two uh, attachments that should be uploaded in this other attachments section, um, sorry, there are, only two, there are only two other attachments that are required for this other attachment section, and that is the baseline data on the training pool and the recruitment plan to enhance diversity. There are two other, other attachments that could be uh, attached here, and that are the uh, advisory committee attachment and the training activities attachment, and these are optional. Any other attachment that would have gone into the other attachment section in a previous IMSD or GRISE NOFO are now no longer allowed. Next slide, please. Um, just a few words about this baseline data on the trainee pool. So the point of this data is to describe the training grant eligible individuals who further the goals of the proposed research training program. And the reason we need this data is so that we can uh, review the planned activities and uh, you, inclu including your recruitment and to determine uh, the appropriate number of slots for the program. You are strongly encouraged to use the suggested formats table A for this baseline data. And uh, when you get this, when you download this, uh, slide presentation, uh, that link is live and you can click on that link to get to table A. The, this baseline data on the trainee pool replaces information that would otherwise be part of table 6A. Do not include table 6A in your application. We don't want table 6A. Instead, we want this attachment, baseline data on the trainee pool. This baseline data on trainee pool attachment should be included in this other attachment section that I just showed you and not in the NIH data tables. Next slide, please. Um, 
This other form that I want to highlight is the research training program plan form. Um, and you see that there are a lot of documents here that need to be um, also included in the application. And so here is the part that I was trying to be careful to say other attachments. So those other attachments went into that other attachment section earlier. Um, and all these, uh, all these additional ad attachments are also uh, required. Um, uh, next slide, please. OK, so the research training program plan um, is the 25 pages uh, that would be uh, uploaded in this section. For this component, please follow the NOFO, not the SF424 application guide, and make sure you include um, the elements that are listed here. Um, these elements are all described in the NOFO, and uh, you should have headers in your document uh, corresponding to di these different headers. Next slide, please. Um, the attachment that is the plan for instruction for enhancing reproducibility continues to be required. Please follow the SF424 application guide for the instructions, and you may also uh, click on these links for additional resources to help you prepare this document. Next slide, please. Um, this is the plan for instruction in responsible conduct of research. Um, again, comply with the SF424 application guide instructions, and there are links there um, to those instructions and to resources. But in addition, uh, the application also needs to um, show how the instruction in responsible conduct of research is well integrated into the overall curriculum for the program at multiple stages of trainee development in a variety of formats and contexts. You should also explain how this teaching of RCR synergizes with the overall curriculum and enhances trainees' ability to conduct rigorous and reproducible research. In addition, um, you should describe how program faculty will reiterate and augment key elements of the responsible conduct of research when their trainees are performing research in their labs. Next slide, please. For renewal applications only, and um, the applications that are eligible to be submitted as renewals um, were listed in an earlier slide, uh, you will need a progress report. And this progress report is intended to show that the program was successful at strengthening the uh, research training environment and promoting broader participation. Importantly, you should describe uh, any challenges or program shortcomings that you identified and sound plans for overcoming or remediating them. So having challenges is not necessarily a problem if you have, dis if you have identified the challenges and come up with ways to overcome those challenges, but ignoring those challenges uh, is likely going to be a problem for your renewal application. In addition, uh, you should include a summary for each trainee of their progress, and um, that summary can be up to a page long, um, and you should follow the SF424 for instructions on that summary. Next slide, please. Um, this is back to that research training program plan form, and I wanted to talk about the faculty, trainees, and training records section of that form. Um, and all three require all three elements in here are required. Next slide, please. Um, so faculty bio sketches, uh, you should submit a bio sketch for each of the faculty mentors in the program. And these faculty bio sketches should be tailored to the training program. So it is um, not really appropriate for you to simply use a bio sketch that would have been used for um, the faculty mentors R01 application, for example. Um, in this bio sketch, the faculty mentor needs to address how they are committed to training and mentoring in this training program and to promoting rigor, reproducibility, and safety 
as described in the NOFO. And I want to highlight that there is a new format for the faculty bio sketches that should be followed. Next slide, please. Uh, section eight is the letters of support. So there is a single required letter with a 10 page maximum. And this is a letter that describes the organization's eligibility for the GRISE or IMSD program as applicable and uh, describes the support the organization will provide for the training program. Um, so this letter needs to be on organizational letterhead, needs to be signed by a president, a provost, or a dean, or a similar key leader at the organization. So as I said before, uh, this letter needs to certify the eligibility of the applicant organization for the particular program to which you are applying, and needs to describe the activities and resources that the organization will provide to ensure the success of the plan training program and its trainees. Uh, again, there's information in the NOFO about the elements of support that should be described. Um, so you should follow that. If this letter is not included, the application will be considered incomplete and will not be re reviewed. Um, if you have other letters of support, for example, from uh, other organizations, these are permitted um, but they should not duplicate any information um, that is supposed to be in the main organizational support letter. Next slide, please. Ah, the data tables. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, before we uh, look at the data tables, so this is just a summary of the data tables that are going to be required for new or renewal applications. Um, you see that table 6A has been X'd out. And that's because, as I said before, Table 6A should not be in your application. And instead, the information in that would be in Table 6A should instead be in that other attachment document uh, titled Baseline Data on Training Pool. Um, there are links to training instructions for the data tables. And um, NIGMS has also very recently uh, produced informational videos that. Uh, are designed to help you complete this, these NIH data tables. And so you can click on that link uh, to access those videos. Next slide, please. Um, so here's just a list of those training tables and the content that would be in those tables. This is just for your reference. Next slide. What is important is that those training tables do not just stand alone, but instead the key data from those training tables should be summarized and expanded upon if necessary in the program plan. Um, and this is to highlight the characteristics of your training grant eligible pool and to make the case that um, organizationally uh, you have the appropriate um, faculty and support to uh, support student outcomes and that your previous student outcomes um, justify uh, the number of slots that you are requesting. Again, um, I keep saying this because it's important, please do not submit table 6A. Um, instead, submit that baseline data as I mentioned earlier. And again, importantly, applications that don't include the required training tables or that have additional data tables in this data table section will be withdrawn prior to review. So please make sure you don't do that. Next slide, please. Um, table 8A, which I just wanted to highlight that there are differences in table 8A depending on whether uh, you're submitting a renewal application or a new application. So new applications should complete only part three uh, renewal applications complete parts one, two, and four. This data should be discussed in the training program plan narrative. Um, and it should be clear when, if, if you happen to be discussing um, groups of students that may not have been included in table 8A, it is helpful for you to clearly explain um, that that is what you are doing. 
um, because otherwise um, it can get very confusing that you know the numbers don't add up. Next slide, please. So here are here's a list of additional table resources that um, help you fill out those tables um, and understand what's supposed to be on them. Next slide. And here is a list of um, additional resources for the RISE and IMSD programs, including answers to frequently asked questions and a dashboard of funded programs. We also encourage you to consult um, one of us before submission um, if you have any questions. And so now I'm going to turn things over to Justin, who will talk about budgetary issues. Hi, everyone. This is Justin Rosenzweig from NIGMS Grants Management. I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over some important points that you'll want to keep in mind as you assemble your budget uh, for your application. Next slide, please. So obviously, a big um, important portion of your budget request uh, for a training or grant is some of the student categories, specifically the stipends, tuition, and fees. What really makes um, training grants unique is that this is the only mechanism outside of um, fellowships where uh, you can actually request and we award uh, stipends. So NRSA awards provide stipends as a subsistence allowance to help defray living expenses during the research training experience. NIH will also contribute to the combined cost of tuition and fees at the rate in place at the time of award. So one really uh, one really important um, side note that I want to add to the second bullet is for your tuition request, please make sure that you input the actual tuition rate at your university at the time of award. If you um, if you apply the formula, the formula is sixty percent of the requested cost up to 16,000. That's the cap amount for tuition. If you apply that formula in your budget page, we're gonna end up applying it again because the SF424 instructions, they tell you to input the actual tuition amount at your institution. So please make sure that you use the actual uh, tuition and fees that you have in place at the time that you submit your application. Stipend levels, as well as funding amounts for tuition and fees, and the institution allowance are announced annually in the NIH uh, Guide for Grants and Contracts and are also posted um, on the NRSA webpage that NIH maintains. Next slide, please. So another uh, big portion of your request uh, for your trainees is um, trainee travel. And NIGMS will provide up to 1,000 uh, or 1,250 for institutions outside the continental United States per trainee for travel to scientific meetings and workshops. Trainees must be appointed to the training grant at the time of the actual travel for this to be an allowable cost. Plans for trainee travel should be well justified in the budget justification. Next slide, please. So the last uh, big category, um, the last big direct cost category in your budgets is uh, training related expenses or TRE. And this is essentially the everything else uh, category. Um, NIH provides funds uh, through TRE to help defray other research training expenses, such as health insurance, staff salaries, consultant costs, equipment, research supplies, and faculty staff travel directly related to the research training program. Now this is the fork in the road um, is the amount for these two mechanisms, it's slightly different. For IMSD, TRE is capped at 10,000 per trainee per year. And for GRISE, TRE is capped at uh, 12,500 per trainee per year. Now we expect organizations to prioritize trainee benefits such as health insurance out of TRE, but there's everything else that I mentioned previously in the first bullet are examples of items that would come out of TRE that you can uh, request in your budget justification. The grant does not set firm limits for allowable costs. Um, this is what is different about these new announcements compared to what was in the previous iterations for IMSD and GRISE. Um, in those announcements, we set uh, examples of what we expected to see. In this announcement, we don't do that at all. And 
there are no set caps on, for example, a uh, salary for your um, program coordinator. Training related expenses should be like everything else, well justified in the budget justification. Next slide, please. So just to close uh, my portion now, a couple of reminders on the budget justification. Um, we really draw a lot out of what you're requesting from your uh, budget justification. It's extremely important that you put detail into it. Um, so you're gonna wanna state the number of requested funded trainee slots per year. Provide a justification for the number of requested funded slots per year in the context of the following points. The number of training grant eligible candidates provided in the trainee pool baseline data across all departments participating in the training program the number of participating faculty, and other NIGMS-funded training grants at the organization that relate to the goals of the training program. Now, if you have a renewal application, if you already have a current uh, funded program, the success and filling the awarded training positions should be detailed in the application. An explanation for the failure to fill previously requested slots should be provided in the application. Uh, and the last, last point um, is that you are encouraged to describe the total effort for personnel and the budget and the budget justification. And but what we mean by that is delineate the effort charged to the grant and the effort compensated by their sources. So, for example, if you have a program coordinator that is going to be contributing um, four months of effort to this program, but you're really only going to charge two months worth of salary from the grant please explain that. Um, if we just see four months, we're going to assume that you're charging four months of effort. Um, it, it's extremely helpful to just state what the effort level is. And then if some of that effort is covered by institutional funds or another source to just delineate that so we can know how much you're actually requesting from the grant for that position. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Sonia now. Okay, thank you, Justin. Um, my name is Sonia Ortiz Miranda. I'm, I'm a scientific review officer and um, the scientific review branch at uh, NIGMS. And I guess, uh, next slide, please. Just gonna provide um, basic information about the review process of your applications. In this uh, first slide, I'm um, offering information about the standing review panels where your IMSD and GRISE applications will be reviewed. Um, your applications would be assigned to either the Training and Workforce Development or TWDC or D. These are identical review panels that operate in essentially the same way. And the main reasons, uh, are that for having two panels instead of one is to handle uh, the workload and, and take care of any conflicts that might uh, present during a particular round. But the members um, of both committees are oriented in the same, at the same time and receive the same exact information regarding review. Once your application is assigned to the panel, um, your SRO is gonna contact you um, and um, to let you know um, which panel your application has been assigned to, uh, the review meeting date, and any other basic information such as uh, providing instructions how to submit post-submission materials that are allowed. Uh, sometimes we include the roster or uh, who your appropriate contacts um, are through the review and the post-review process. Once the review meeting then has concluded, then this SRO is gonna be the person releasing your scores and providing your summary statements uh, that you can access through your ERA Commons accounts. Next slide, please. This slide is mostly for the benefit of new applicants and it basically uh, provides a little bit more detail about the timeframe um, to help you understand what happens in between the time you submit your application and the earliest uh, award start date. Um, 
when your application comes in, it takes us around one to two months to check for eligibility and compliance issues um, and assign applications to specific study sections. And then from that point on, it would take about six to seven months after the application is submitted for the review meetings to occur and you being able to get your summer statements. After that, uh, the advisory council meets uh, and the funding decisions are announced shortly after that. Therefore, the earliest award uh, start date would be nine to 10 months uh, after the original application was submitted. So please just, it's important then to plan ahead. Next slide, please. Okay, in order to evaluate your application, um, uh, reviewers uh, will be using the criteria that is uh, described in section five of the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which is also known as NOFO. Uh, the section name application review information. Um, it's, it's very important because um, it explains what information uh, the reviewers are gonna be looking for in your application as they evaluate them for uh, scientific merit. Um, next slide, please. So, what is included in this section five is basically the five individual score review criteria, which um, maybe um, you have seen a little bit of this before, but it is um, basically the training program and environment, the program directors, uh, co-PIs or investigators or co-investigators, uh, the preceptors and mentors, this basically is the participating faculty, and the trainees and uh, the training record. This last two criteria have been recently um, revised and I'm gonna be mentioning it in a little bit more in the next slide. But um, you can see um, that some of these criteria have subcategories and all the headings here map down to an extensive list of evaluation questions that are posted in section five of the NOFO. This is just a, be, a brief overview to make sure that you have addressed all this uh, necessary information uh, and it's included in your application. Finally, I just need to mention that uh, these five criteria would receive individual scores and are also a factor into your overall impact score. Next slide, please. This is... Um, a little bit more information about the trainee criteria. Just please make sure that you include clear information about the review process to select the candidates uh, to appoint trainees and any other financial support that might be provided. Also key information for the training record criteria is shown here. And in general, this allows the evaluation of program outcomes and how you intend to assess your program success and share that information with the public. This is especially important for new programs where maybe uh, the outcomes, you have a little bit less, less information uh, on the outcomes side. Next slide, please. In addition to the five score review criteria, we have another section that is called additional review criteria. And this ones do not get individual scores, but they are um, included when reviewers are um, trying to establish an overall impact score for the application. Um, they normally are uh, rated as acceptable or not acceptable. And if they the reviewers find this unacceptable, they normally tell you why. They normally uh, add a little comment explaining why they think it is not acceptable. Uh, this uh, would include uh, the training methods for enhancing reproducibility plan, the recruitment plan to enhance diversity, the training and the training for responsible conduct of research plan. You have heard already um, details about this. Um, the protection for human subjects, vertebrate animals, and biohazards are always um, in other type of applications part of this section, but they tend to not be um, applicable 
for GRIVES, um, for, for our applications and IMS Bing. Um, but reviewers uh, are encouraged to point out at something they might think it's not quite right um, to be um, addressed um, later on. Um, if your application is a resubmission, the reviewers will consider your responses to the previous critiques. And if your application is a renewal, then reviewers will consider what progress you have made within the last funding period. This also had been mentioned um, before um, by Joyce. Um, next slide, please. Um, the last thing reviewers will consider are the additional review considerations, which for IMSD and GRISE um, applications consists mostly of how appropriate the number of requested training slots are in view of what has been proposed and the population of training grant eligible candidates at the institution. This section uh, obviously is not included as, as a factor in your overall impact score. Next slide, please. The last two slides, uh, basically, um, I'm going to provide um, some of our I guess, best advice to applicants uh, as they go through the application process. And the first one uh, we always mention is that it's because it's absolutely essential that you submit your applications as early as possible. This would allow you to have ample time to review your applications for completeness and, and correct errors um, that might have occurred during the submission process. Please be aware that not all errors are caught by the automatic system in the era. Um, um, once the deadline passes, then applications will be withdrawn for missing or for including unallowed material. So it is the responsibility of the PI to make sure everything is correct in the application. Okay. We are including some uh, information on the application guide and a link there at the end of the slide. slide please. This is sort of my last slide. And again, finally, just things to keep in mind when you prepare your application. Based on our experience of SROs, um, we encourage you to uh, be clear in your applications and try not to bury important information or expect reviewers to be able to read between the lines. Include clear, measurable, and attainable goal, uh, program goals and provide current uh, information. And uh, again, um, as it was uh, described before, make sure your bio sketches uh, are current and they contain relevant information to a training program. They are not R01 um, grant um, uh, statements. Here. It, 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 you, I have heard so many uh, reviewers uh, remarking about biosketches that do not mention um, mentoring or training at all. So it, it is hard for them to evaluate the qualifications of that that faculty uh, member. And also the institutional data and, and student information should be current. Um, I also want to encourage everybody to be consistent. Uh, the information between tables and the text across tables or between budget items and the justifications should always match. You need to be especially cognizant of this. If you have different people writing different portions of, of the grant application, because it is very frustrating to reviewers um, when they find this numbers that are inconsistent and they don't know which data is correct and, and what they should use to base their evaluations on. And in terms of outcomes, uh, I think this was also made, uh, mentioned before. Just be truthful about them. 
reviewers are, are, are very keen on picking up when an applicant is trying to maybe over embellish a little section more than you know usual or sort of to hide and draw attention from other sections. Uh, we see uh, sometimes this when the program has a put our outcome in the past, just do not try to hide that. Explain what you had learned from uh, the past and what improvements and evidence science, evidence-based practices you're going to put in place to ensure you will have better outcomes going forward. Uh, we're providing um, a link at the bottom of the slide. It's a feedback loop post that provides guidance on common mistakes and how to avoid them. Um, next slide, please. I guess that, that's it for me. Uh, this is just contact information um, and how to, uh, again, um, seek information from us, especially uh, from program staff um, before and after, uh, before submitting your application and, and um, after the review has concluded and the summary statements are available, you can always ask information from us uh, about re uh, review issues. And uh, then uh, there's uh, Justin's email in here about um, financial and grants management issues. I think with that, uh, we are gonna be open for questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Um, before, while people are taking a couple minutes maybe to add additional questions into the Q&A box, I want to make sure we thank some additional NIGMS staff who, <clears throat> excuse me, who weren't speaking in today's webinar, but certainly were invaluable in helping us. Uh, Tony, Tamika, and his uh, their staff, uh, we want to thank you for your assistance with this. Um, but please, we've answered some of the questions in the q and I believe we've addressed most of them, um, unless Justin wanted to add anything verbally. Sometimes his questions are a little more complicated, but um, please feel free to enter any additional questions or raise your hand if you uh, prefer to, to speak the question aloud. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I see one I'll just go ahead and address um, that just came in. Uh, we mentioned there are circumstances where we could request two or three years depending on training circumstances. Can you elaborate on what scenarios would be allowed? So um, this, this refers to <clears throat> for GRISE, excuse me, GRISE and IMSD. Typically trainees are supported for two or three years of the PhD. Um, so some programs could some programs take an approach of two years and a possible third year for some trainees would be one example of our structure. In those cases, they may outline some of the conditions that they would use to determine whether a third year is appropriate. We don't have a list of those circumstances that we um, that we have. We don't have a preset list. So we encourage you again, as we've um, hopefully conveyed earlier in this webinar, to design your program based on your institution and the needs of your trainees. So you are uh, able to propose what, what those uh, conditions might be. You can always, if you are unsure whether this is an allowed or, or unallowed cost, you're welcome to contact us in advance to ask that question. Um, but whatever that plan that you include in your application as reviewers will weigh in on whether they think that this is appropriate and, and um, is evidence informed, uses the, the uh, meets the objectives of your program, et cetera. So if anyone else, please add to that if I'm missing something. Uh, Mary Ann, would you like to ask a question aloud? Yes, thanks. I, I did ask it in the chat earlier, but I, I'd like a little more clarification on the number of slots uh, to request. Is there, I mean, I would hate to request for 12 and then the reviewers say, oh no, you could only get two because that would, you know, be reviewed unfavorably. So I'm wondering if there's like a formula. So say we have a hundred uh, candidates that matriculate every year and say 30 trainers, um, you know, how many slots would that be applicable? 
Sure. So I'll start, but I'm sure some of my colleagues may want to add as well. So one, we don't have a formula. Um, I think some of the comments I entered into the chat, and they're certainly in the no foes of the factors to consider that would influence what you think your institution can support, the size of the trainee grant eligible trainees, the uh, number of available qualified faculty mentors, et cetera. Um, but if the reviewers recommend a different number of slots, that's something that NIGMS will take an advisement, but it should not be something that negatively affects score. But Sonia, please elaborate if, if you want to comment on that aspect. Yeah, normally that they, you know, especially the number of uh, slots, it's not really um, part of the score um, um, criteria for the application. That's completely separate. And actually, that normally happens after everybody had given the application, you know, a score. That is. Um, and what I can say is that um, sometimes um, they request the number of slots. Um, it's seen by um, reviewers as, you know, they might change what is um, being requested based on their evaluation of um, how many uh, candidates they, they, see, they say, you know, or they seem, it seem to be available um, uh, in, in, the, in the student kind of population. Um, Sometimes it's based on the outcomes, you know, because they have not been able to use, you know, some of the um, uh, training slots in, in maybe the previous funding cycle. So it sounds like they don't have necessarily the population to provide that that number that is, you know, being requested and things like that. So th there's a lot of thought. Um, they are not just uh, providing um something that it's, you know, they don't think really um, clearly. And most of the time they provide sort of um, explanation why is that, you know, they are um, um, suggesting a different number than the one that had been requested. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any other uh, comments about that. That's my review perspective. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Um, I put in the chat a link to the GRISE funded programs dashboard, and I'm going to add in the IMSD one as well. That is what that shows the currently active uh, T32 GRISE and IMSD programs, and it, it shows the number of slots um, for each of those institutions. So that gives you a sense of a range, but as we mentioned, we don't have a formula. formula. Thank you. That was very helpful. Okay, I see another question. Are faculty with the status of Professor Emeritus eligible to serve as PIs or MPIs? Justin, do you want to start with this? I don't know. If it's not defined readily in the program announcement, that's something you're just going to want to email us about separately and we can get back to you. Uh, so that can happen real quick if you don't. There, there's a, in the, in the, um, just kidding, I'm, um, Oversee the IMSD and GRIS programs, working with uh, Sidel, Jeremy, and and Joyce. Um, and so, in the in the eligibility section under eligible individuals, there's language that says the contact PDPI is expected to have a full time appointment at the applicant organization unless extremely well justified. And so, the expectation is that the contact PI will be at the applicant organization. And again, um, as as my colleagues mentioned earlier, uh, we encourage multi-PI structures, we do expect the contact PI to have a full-time appointment um, at the applicant organization. And, and if that changes after the award is made, that's a prior approval. So we have to approve that change. And so you can just take that under advisement. Um, but we know each institution, each organization has its own sort of structure that it's thinking about. But that is the expectation in the uh, NOFO under the eligibility, uh, specifically eligible individuals, program director slash principal investigator. Yeah, so I think Justin's point as well. Thank you, Kenny, because institutions may define that status differently. So I guess we don't have a blanket answer for that. Uh, everyone have a uh, happy holidays and good luck putting your applications together. Um, we're here to help. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.